Welcome to the 27th Annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dean Nelson on the journalism faculty, and it is our privilege to have Nadia Boltz-Weber with us, a pastor and author. Her books include Pastrix, subtitled The Cranky Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint, Accidental Saints, Finding God in All the Wrong People, and Shameless, A Sexual Reformation, and an under-the-radar book that helped awaken her as a writer, which we'll talk about, called Salvation on the Small Screen. She also has a podcast called The Confessional and a blog called The Corners. She appears on Moth Radio, used to do stand-up comedy. She's the founder of the church, The House for All Sinners and Saints in Denver, and was recently named a public pastor for the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. She communicates with depth, vulnerability, humor, and a theological grounding that is a combination I find in no other writer. Nadia Boltz-Weber, welcome to the Writer's Symposium. Thank you. So, your most recent three books. Uh, I think there's an evolution in you as a writer from Pastrix to Accidental Saints to Shameless. Pastrix is about your story and the story of the church you started. Accidental Saints is more about others, maybe members of that congregation, but how God is revealed in surprising people and in surprising ways. And then Shameless is about an issue that has been avoided or mishandled uh, in organized religion. Is that how you see your writing evolved as well? In that sort of, first it's about me, now it's about these others, and now it's about this broader topic? Yeah, I think so. I think that's pretty accurate. I mean, I, it, it's hard to say. I say I wrote three memoirs. Like, I call them all memoirs because they're so personal. But certainly, Shameless was more topical. But um, yeah, I think so. I, I've never known what genre my writing was because it's like theological and it's personal essay and it's, it, it's so many different things combined that I, I always have a hard time. I just say it's memoir because it's easier. Yeah, just call it nonfiction. Nonfiction, yeah. 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 <laughs> that works, but, but it's got this kind of broadening out yeah. Uh, it, it, with each book. And yeah. I, ju I just found that uh, just so interesting to see your scope broaden with each one. Yeah. However, it's that first one, that Salvation on the Small Screen <laughs> book, kind of under the radar. Right. I read it. Not what we would call an important piece of work. But, <laughs> but isn't that what sort of awakened you as, hey, I, I think I... I've got something to say. Mostly it just paid to replace our furnace. <laughs> I mean, the, I, well, we that were- Well, that too, but- we were, I was in seminary and we were, you know, living on $36,000 a year, my family of four, and I had started this blog just to try to make sense of what I was learning in seminary. And the Episcopal Publishing House came to me and they said, um, hey, we, we like your blog. We're looking for somebody who's theological and funny and to watch 24 consecutive hours of Trinity Broadcasting Network. And I was like, doesn't the Geneva Convention address doing that to somebody <laughs> like, I don't know that that's allowed, but. They do that at, they do that at Guantanamo now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I said, well, will you pay me in advance? And it was a very, very small amount of money. And they said, yes. And I said, I agreed to write the book because I needed a new furnace. But, it, it, well, that, that's why I think it's so wonderful because uh, you never aspired to be a writer. Never, never. So did, was there something about that event, though, besides getting a furnace that said, <laughs> uh, hey, maybe I should pursue this a little bit. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed the process. I, there was a lot to learn in the process. It's really like a long blog post. It's not, you know, really important, but, um, but, uh, but it, 
but it felt like an accomplishment to do it. And I liked reflecting and learning. And um, it, yeah, I didn't intend to be a writer. I never aspired to it. So when I got the contract to write Pastrix, I went to a writing workshop in town, Lighthouse Writers in Denver, which is um, the literary hub in Denver. And they had creative nonfiction workshops. And I just didn't know how to write. I, I mean, I, I had no, I, I was a talker with a laptop. That's different than being a writer. And so I, I had a lot to learn. You know, I knew how to turn a phrase and I knew how to state things in a funny way or whatever. But, um, but the craft of writing was something I've can, I feel like a beginner, right? I, I still feel like a beginner. So what did the workshop help you get a handle on? Because I, I, some writing workshops are, they're hit and miss. You know, right? it was taught by the guy who wrote Blood Diamonds. Um, and which was made into a film, and he's a masterful nonfiction writer. Um, I think I learned different sort of techniques. Like, I didn't know, like, how do you start a chapter? Like, how do you, wh what's, a, what's a creative way to do it? And he's like, well, why don't you talk about something that is sensory to begin with? Start describing what you're seeing or the smell of something as an entry point into a chapter. Um, I don't know that I would have intuitively thought of doing that. So uh, for me, it was, it was helpful to get other people's notes on, I workshopped a couple of chapters of Pastrix there. Those can be brutal. Yeah, they were, they were helpful. I mean, if they were stupid notes, they were from stupid people I didn't care what they thought, so it was fine. <laughs> Yeah. That's just a good lesson in yeah, general. Yeah, it is a good lesson. <laughs> but but you've, you've got these themes really in all the books, regardless of uh, the trajectory of them, but it's, it's about forgiveness, and there's grace, and there's mercy, and there's how you just get surprised by the presence of God uh, in all of those. Um, Writing gave you a chance to put some language onto all that, right? Yeah. I mean, there are just certain ideas I'm constantly almost haunted by. Like, they, they never leave me, that I see their lenses that I see the world through. I, there are things that I can see in a, in a story I hear or a TV show I watch. It's like I'm always looking, I'm scanning. It's like this sonar like you see in movies they're in a submarine there's a sonar and every once there's a blip right mm -hmm. i do that for things like grace and mercy and compassion and forgiveness these are the things i'm obsessed with because these are the things that i feel like have transformed me have created some kind of death and resurrection in me and so I end up just looking for them all the time in the world. But shame and revenge and condescension and superiority. I love those things too. I think in all fairness, those are, <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I. I <laughs> They're so much easier, right? <laughs> they are. I, um, I, I always say like self-righteousness feels good for a minute, but only in the way that peeing your pants feels warm for a minute. <laughs> and, then, and then it gets cold and smells bad and people notice. But, I, but for a minute, <laughs> it feels really good, you know? It's the same with self-righteousness. I feel like there are things that, um, there are things that I lean towards naturally, which are the condescension and the self-righteousness and the anger. I, I mean, even, even with 30 years of being sober and even with the personal work I've done in seminary and being a, considered a spiritual leader, honest to God, my first reaction to almost everything is F you. <laughs> like, now I don't often stay there, but I almost always start there. And, so I haven't, even with all that work, I, I haven't had a, like a personality transplant. I still struggle with the same things, but it feels like now I'm able to move to something else quicker. 
but my starting, I, I try to not judge where I am by my starting point because my, my first reaction to things is almost always the same. Yeah, so you can judge where you are by how long you stay there. Yeah, I think that's right. right? That's exactly right, yeah. So you grew up with a lot of anger. As I read you know, about your background and things, you grew up with a lot of anger. You had a, a, a medical condition that kind of set you apart from, from everybody. And I, and I just wonder, do you think that plays a role in how you speak to people who are kind of out on the margins, the ones who don't fit in? Do you think that background, that rage that you used to have or maybe still have, the physical issues, do you think that plays a role in, in you as a writer and who you speak to? Yeah, I mean, the origin of the rage does. Yeah, not the rage itself. I mean, we all have different reactions to the traumas in our lives. Um, my reaction was always anger, but it was the trauma. I mean, it was the alienation that I experienced growing up that allowed me to be the pastor that I am to the people I'm a pastor to. So um, there's a story in Accidental Saints about how when I started the church, um, people were like assumed it was like a hipster church, which it never has been. And it was because of how I looked. And they're like, well, pastors attract people like themselves, so it must be like a church for hipsters. Obviously, I don't look like a hipster now. I'm just a 52-year-old white lady. But at that point... But you got the tattoos. I have the tattoos. Those yeah, haven't yeah, yeah. gone away. But, yeah. um, and I would look around at the events that we would do and at church, and it was, it was a lot of socially awkward people. It was a lot of people who just really, truly didn't fit in. They weren't actually cool at all. They were awkward. And, um, and there was a part of me for a minute, I was like, why am I not attracting people like me? <laughs> and, um, and, um, <laughs> and, and then I was like, oh my gosh, I am. I, I, I am attracting people like me, but it's not the like funny, tattooed, cool person that is bringing them in. It's the skinny, bug-eyed girl who ate all of her lunches alone in middle school who has been attracting these people all along. And I was like too arrogant to realize that. And when I did realize that, it was the, the profoundly bullied, alienated part of me that was attracting the people who were coming, I had so much more compassion for them and so much more compassion for myself. You know, w w one of the ways you illustrate this um, is, I think it's at the beginning of Shameless, where you're looking at some farmland yeah. from the sky. Yeah. And I checked this out with a farmer, by the way, <laughs> I, and and you're right. Thank I just you. Wanted you. Just wanted to verify, <laughs> but but I, that helps illustrate who you think you're speaking to and who you're a pastor to. So, what is that imagery of what you saw from the sky? So, it was, um, you know, how you look over when you're flying over farmland, and sometimes there are these circles of the crops. And I looked out and I was like, why do they plant crops in circles in lots that are truly square? Like, and it ends up that um, the center pivot irrigation uh, was a revolution in the agricultural field where they could, um, the, the, they would water crops in a circular pattern. So it's not that the crops aren't planted in the corners, it's that the water never gets to them. And I described the, the teachings of the church as a center point irrigation in the fact that they might be fine and nourish the people at the center, but a lot of us are planted in the corners and those teachings don't reach our lives and our experience or use our language or our imagery. And so that's, uh, that's why I call my online publication The Corners. Great image. You, you told me that 
reading Anne Lamott's book, Traveling Mercies, was significant to you. Why yeah. was that? So I was uh, a young mom, and uh, I had two little kids. I was married to this Lutheran pastor. We were living in dryland wheat farming country, uh, a town of 5,000 people in the middle of nowhere. And I'd been sober at this point, you know, eight or nine years, um, had come back to the church after not having anything to do with Christianity, but um, didn't really fit in in this small farming town. And I felt very much alone. And somebody gave me a copy of Anne Lamott's Traveling Mercies. And when I finished reading it, I was like, how is she not my best friend? <laughs> I, I had no idea there was more than one of us uh, that was like liberal and foul-mouthed and Christian and a recovering alcoholic and had so much of the same story. And um, I felt less alone as the result of reading a book for the first time in my life because of that book. Isn't that really why we read? And why we write yeah. is to feel less alone. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, is that why you write? <laughs> it's, it's why I started. You know, when I was in seminary, I'm like taking these, you know, systematic theology courses, which are so dense and so kind of esoteric. And I thought, if I cannot articulate these ideas in my own vernacular, then I shouldn't even be in graduate school. For, for whatever reason, that was the, my own test for myself, was can I, if, if I can't articulate this in a way that my friends would understand, I shouldn't be in seminary to begin with. And so when I started the Sarcastic Lutheran blog, it was to do that. And, um, and, then, I, and then people started responding and they started reading it, and I was really surprised by it. And so when I, like during the pandemic, I wrote, prayers for the, the, from March to March, March 20th to March 2020, or 20, sorry, I have COVID brain fog. From March 2020 to March 2021, almost every Sunday I'd write prayers, but it wasn't like, what do the people need to hear this week? It was, what am I desperate to say, to hear God hear me say, to communicate this week? And every Sunday I would sit down and connect to like, what is the most honest thing I can say right now in the form of a prayer, given what's going on in the world? And then if people related to them, found them helpful, liked them, that was a bonus. But I really was doing it for myself. Which is why it resonates so well, because it was so authentic. <laughs> So here's, here's another one of the things I think you do so well. You just take these everyday situations, moments, people, conversations. Uh, it could be a panic attack on a mountain road. It could be a, a conversation at a boring clergy meeting. Pardon the redundancy. <laughs> um, you, or you going to a shooting range. You just just stuff that all of us do. Mm -hmm. And then you find something holy in the middle of it. You find something sacred in the middle of it. Yeah. I, so is that an active thing where you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm out here shooting skeet. I can write about this. Or does this come later as you're reflecting? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, sometimes it's in the moment. I know this is special, like something's happening. But a lot of times it's when I reflect upon it, I would say. You know, uh, um, Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday, and I'm preaching. I preach regularly at the cathedral in Denver, so I'm preaching Sunday. So I'm reading the Transfiguration text, which shows up in, I think, all the Gospels? Maybe just the synoptics. Anyway, um, you know, he takes couple dudes up on the mountain he's praying and then suddenly he's like transfigured it's like professor mcgonagall transfigured he's <laughs> transfigured and then you know moses and elijah you know the rock stars show up and it's this great epiphany and 
And then Peter says the stupid thing of like, should I run to Home Depot and <laughs> build some shit? Build, yeah, yeah, build some stuff. Make right. a shed. <laughs> Shut up, Peter. <laughs> anyway, um, nobody wants a shed, Peter. Um, <laughs> But the, but the lectionary text always includes, and sometimes it's optional, but it, it is included. They come down the mountain. You know, God speaks. This is my son. Listen to him. And then they go down the mountain, and there's a father who has a son, his only son, who's, who has a demon. And he's convulsing, and he's salivating, and it mauls him from the inside, and he's thrown into the dirt. And... All I, I just was reading the text all day trying to get a, a hook in the sermon, and I was like, I just don't care what happened on the mountain. The most sacred, awe-inspiring thing is that dirt and spit. That's what Jesus healed with. He healed the blind man with dirt and spit. Like, there's something about our children like, I kept thinking about the shame this man must have felt because, like, for, we're in, entering year three of a pandemic. Our kids aren't doing well. <laughs> our kids are not doing well. And how much shame we have when our kids aren't doing well or they're struggling with mental illness or addiction. And how I don't care about what happened on the mountain, but I think that man's a hero for just speaking up and going, like, my son needs some help and making sure he got it. That, I think, is so beautiful. So just today, reading that text, pff, I don't care about the mountain. I care about that kid in the dirt, you know? But we, yeah. <laughs> but we keep searching for those moments on the mountain. Yeah, I know, I know. And those I, ones in the dirt are happening to us all the time. All the time. They? They're just more available. I mean, the and the mountain stuff, that can really be about ego it can be about wanting to collect instagrammable moments spiritually you know and there's nothing wrong with them but i don't find that interesting yeah you know with all of the anecdotes and the specific people and moments you write about in your books do you keep a journal no Oh, stop. Seriously? I don't write anything down. I didn't even take notes in seminary. I knit through all my classes <laughs> because <laughs> I have a hard time paying attention. And, and um, it, I knit like anybody. You talk to somebody who knew me in seminary. She, they're like, she knit every single class. So no, I, I didn't even take notes in graduate school. So how do we know any of this is? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just... I, uh, I, I really don't. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're just, we're just going to have to trust I'm you, sorry. I guess. You know, it, one of the things I, I respect about you so much, though, is, is your willingness to live within a faith structure. Yeah. There are so many people with strong personalities mm -hmm. who they just kind of make up their own sure. faith structure. Um, but when you were leading... House for All Sinners and Saints, and e even as you're speaking now about uh, preaching this Sunday, you stick to the lectionary. Oh, you, yeah. There, no, I'm, a... I'm not to be trusted, really, to just come up with something. <laughs> well, what do people need? You know, I can't do that. I need, <laughs> What's on my mind I know, no, that's a dangerous. So, um, I mean, that's why I thought that, that I was talking to you the, today about that documentary series, Wild, Wild Country, about the Rajneesh Purim cult that was in Oregon and why I thought it was so compelling because this, there was a figure, Sheena, in it who um, was maniacal and she was power hungry. And, and I just kept looking at her going, I can, I, that's who, if I wasn't sober and I didn't have a bishop, I would be her. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, man, I'd get the guns at that point too, for sure. Screw those guys. Like, I, I was right. I, I could totally see myself being that. When I did that Krista Tippett interview, somebody had asked me, uh, they're like, you, you seem really independent, and maybe you have an issue with authority, and you do your own thing. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fair enough. And they said, but you're in a, you're in a, a system under authority. Like, you have a bishop, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, tell us how you've managed to navigate that. And I'm like, are you kidding? 
I'm why we have bishops. <laughs> like, someone like me should probably have a bishop, you know? And electionary. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but it just keeps you grounded, right? It keeps, sure. keeps you on, sort yeah. of on point. For sure it does. But I, I just really respect that, uh, where, where you, as much as maybe your personality might say, no, let's take it this direction. You say, no, I'm going to live under this authority, oh, yeah. whether it's a bishop or whether it's scripture or whether it's, yeah. I mean, know, if the I, liturgy. If I, was, if I went rogue, I'd give it like two, three months before it was a heart of darkness situation. <laughs> it would be entertaining. <laughs> it would be very entertaining. Yeah. Um, but here's, here's another thing that you say, it just seems like throughout everything you write and w when you speak, and that you are writing essentially about raising the dead. Mm -hmm. why, why is that the thing with you? Because it's just what I've experienced myself, I guess. I mean, I, like when I say I'm not to be trusted, that I, I truly believe that in the sense that when when I'm calling all the shots and trying to m manage everything myself and I'm my own higher power, um, I hurt myself and other people. And that um, I, I've stumbled so much in my life and made mistakes that, that have brought me back to life eventually. I mean, I talk about how God's continually digging us out of the graves that we make and loving us back to life. And so there are a million ways that I will dig my own grave through my ego, through wanting to control things, through my own intolerances, the fact that I'm definitely misanthropic, like all of these things. And then in thinking that's what will make me whole, <laughs> Like if, if I just get my way, if people just behave the way I think they should. Um, and yet there's only sort of death along those roads for me. And inevitably I can go along and along and along and eventually I just absolutely crash. And then that's the point where I'm finally like teachable. I feel like I'm finally my, I mean, I talk, about having the divine heart transplant that God reaches in and rips out my heart of stone and replaces it again with something warm and beating and human and um, over and over and over again. So it's not like a metaphor I think that is neat. It's like a thing I keep experiencing despite myself over and over. But, you know, so much of, of organized religion would say, but once, once you get right with God, then, then, it's, then you're good to go, right? And that has not been, that's not how you well, see it. Well, yeah, first of all, good for them. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for some people, for sure, the good news is that if you are pious enough and you do all the right stuff and you are just like this righteous, upstanding, progressively sanctified person. Like, I know we have a lot of Methodists. I'm like, how's that Christian perfection thing working out for you guys? Good? <laughs> you almost there? Like, if not, if you find it's a failed project, there's so much room in the Lutheran tradition for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for so many people, to be in right relationship with God is to sanctify yourself so much that you never, ever really need to bug him for anything. Uh, it's a form of atheism, honestly. And so um, for others, to be in right relationship with God is to be so aware of how in need of God's grace we are that you recognize it and receive it readily and are born again over and over again. So, yeah. You know, you, you mentioned atheism. I, I think it's really interesting that you have said over the years, you, even in your time away from being in organized religion, um, you never went the atheism route. Why not? I don't know. I, 
I, th I do think that faith is a gift. And I, I, I couldn't, I can't make myself have it. <laughs> I just have it. I mean, in Luther's small catechism, he's like, um, you know, that, that even the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is what creates faith in us so that even our faith, because a lot of times we're like, you know, God's pretty good, but the gift I give God is my faith, you know, yeah. <laughs> like that's my part of the bargain. He's pretty lucky. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, he's lucky to have me in his corner. But, um, but, but Luther talks about like, it, it's the Holy Spirit that creates us, creates it in us. So I, t I've always just seen it as a gift. Sometimes I've seen it as a curse, you know, it would be more convenient to not have this thing. It certainly would be like less embarrassing, you know, if I was atheist, like that feels super cool, but I couldn't, I can't pull it off. You know, I, I'd be lying. You also said that you could never be a Unitarian. No, they're, they have too high, I mean, they're super smart and fun to hang out with, but they have too high of an opinion of human beings. <laughs> it makes me wonder if they read the paper, yeah. Um, I'm, I have what's called a low anthropology, so it's called having a low theological anthropology, which is mean, just means that I just don't think people are very good. And so um, that means uh, things never surprise me, like if people are horrible, like, I can't believe that person did that. I'm like, oh, I can. I can, I always believe people can do bad things. Like we get in trouble when we assume people won't do bad things, you know? And so a high, now most people who have a low anthropology are very conservative too. Now I'm a liberal with a low anthropology. It's very lonely. There's like two dozen of us. <laughs> It's not, it's not a popular club. No. <laughs> but, but this, I don't know, it, it, it just raises this other theme. I know I keep coming back to themes in your writing, but sinner and saint mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is one of the things you keep coming back to. This is yeah. what attracted you to Lutheran tradition. Well, I'm I'm mostly committed to it because it's tattooed on my wrist, and I, I feel like I can't change tracks now. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's, it's in, there. It's in Latin. It's there forever. Um, but we're both. We're we are both. So Luther says that we're simultaneously sinner and saint, 100 percent of both all the time. I one thing I love about Lutheran theology is it's it's based in paradox rather than certainty. And so we are paradoxical beings. We are simultaneously sinner and saint. And when I heard them say that, when I sort of came into the Lutheran church in my 20s, I just thought it explained a lot about myself and it explained a lot about other people. And um, I just, I like things to feel like they're honest. And so to think that we are one and not the other, is to tell ourselves half the truth. So in, in the book, Pastrix, you open with a story about Mary Magdalene at the tomb of Jesus, and you emphasize this phrase, while it was still dark. This is the same phrase you preached out of at Rachel Held Evans' funeral. She was here uh, as a guest of our, our symposium. That sermon was so deep and so profound in that setting of loss and grief. Why is that phrase so important to you while it was still dark? Because that's just the only place that resurrection starts. I mean... Hmm. It starts in the dark. And in terms of that sermon and that moment, I was, you know, I was with Rachel when she died. And, um, and I knew that as a figure who brought, I'm sure to many people here, so much in terms of rescuing our faith and rescuing our hearts and, she, she meant so much to so many of us that I knew that it was, to lose her felt like a really dark place. 
And so I, that text of Mary Magdalene, I've always loved that John 20 account because she, like I said in the sermon, when she had such a dark life, she had wrestled with demons. Um, and yet that's not what disqualified her in any way, shape, or form spiritually. It's what actually qualified her to be the first true witness of the resurrection, to be told to go tell the boys about it, you know? And what did the boys say? Well, when, when, the, when the boys looked in the tomb, all they saw was laundry. I don't know if you remember, but... <laughs> And when she looked in the tomb, she saw angels because she had night vision. Well, I've heard you use that phrase before. What is night vision? Night mean? vision means that you are not unfamiliar with the dark and you can see the life that is there or at least burgeoning. And um, I've always valued her for that. And I also love that she mistook gar uh, Jesus for the gardener. <laughs> I always imagine she never lived it down. Like for years, her friends were like, hey, remember when you thought Jesus was a gardener? <laughs> that was hilarious. Um, I preached another sermon about that text in which I said, I think she mistook him from the, for the gardener because he still had the dirt of his own tomb under his nails, you know? And we tidy him up for Easter. That's what we do. We like shine him up. We like get the dirt out. We, you know, put him in a white robe and ra raiment, whatever raiment is, you know, the shiny stuff and well, clean him up. There's a TV show. Everybody loves Raymond. Everybody <laughs> loves Raymond. Yes. And, um, and we tidy him up, you know, because all the visitors are going to come for Easter, you know make him all shiny and clean. I'm like, I don't know, if he had dirt under his nails, if she mistook him from the, for the gardener, that was fresh, you know? So I love that text. I also love that she, I love it. It makes me tear up every time it's read, this one verse, that um, she turned at the sound of her name, you know? He said her name. And I always think like Mary, I think, she felt the most known by Jesus. I think to everyone else, she was probably always the crazy lady because she had the demons cast from her. And I think that she probably remained that crazy lady. And, but to her, she, to him, she was Mary. And her, and her name in his mouth, I think she probably felt truly known in the most uh, profound way when he said her name. But then he asks her, why are you weeping? Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, which at first I'm like, that's unfair. Come on. Like, she's sad, right? Come on. It, like, seems, I, always, seems obvious. I always heard it as like, you know, don't be so emotional or whatever. <laughs> um, but, but it's kind of like when they're on the when there's a storm at sea and, and Peter, and they're scared, and he's like, why are you afraid? I always think, I'm like, that's kind of harsh, Jesus. Like, they're lit, like the boat's filling with water, they're in a storm, and they're about to sink. That's why they're afraid. Like, it's, Seems don't be, obvious. yeah, don't be such an ass. But, um, <laughs> but I think that the question is the why more. It's not like in, like, where is your fear located? Like, it, I think there's a curiosity in his questions, and we always read them as, like, a judgment. So for him to say, like, of, like, what do you... He wanted to hear. He wanted to know. He, it was an invitation for her to express it rather than a judgment of her feeling it, you know? You know, you're, you're viewed by some people as a real threat, to, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why that struck you funny, I but, but I, yeah. your, just your views on stuff for some people yeah. is just really, really problematic. Sure. And um, while your theology might be tied to Lutheran theology, I don't know. There are some people who just say, yeah, but there's, there's some real dissonance in uh -huh. what you do and, and that theology. Mm. And... I'm just, I'm just wondering, 
Are you okay with that? <laughs> yeah, I don't care. No, I really don't. I think it's adorable, but I don't. <laughs> I, I, I'm unbothered. I'm unbothered. Now, um, when I get attacked from the left, it bothers me. That when, when my own tribe comes after me, then that I feel that more. Um, but to, to, I mean, I don't know. People, I'm, I'm unbothered by it by the other side. That's a joke that writes itself. I don't even have to put a punchline on it. Like that, yeah. Okay. I mean, I've been called the, a false prophetess of the end times. That's my favorite. I, wanna, I want that to I, be. I like the S. I like <laughs> yeah. the prophetess. I know. Yeah. You got to put a gender on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, you're all right with the criticism? It, uh, I'm unbothered. I truly am unbothered by that. Yeah, I don't. Okay. I'm not for them. Look, <laughs> the Christian publishing world is their oyster. They do not have a lack of books and articles and magazines and conferences. So I, I, they're going to be fine. I'm not for them. It's okay. Here's, here's actually one of the things I, I, I so appreciate about you. And, and I first saw this in, your, in that book, Salvation in the Small Screen. You're okay saying, you know what? I might be wrong. And here's, mm. here's what I so appreciate. I thought that book was so funny, by the way. <laughs> um, but here's one of the things that you kept coming back to was, it seems like some people are maybe being helped by some of this, yeah. some of this programming. Right, right. And here I am yeah. sitting, I'm kind of making fun of it, right. but I'm also seeing, you know, somebody, somebody's finding this comforting sure. and helpful. Yeah. And, uh, and you kind of saw it as a, a, a way to say, I, I, wonder, I wonder if maybe I need to dial that criticism back a little mm -hmm. bit. Is that an accurate? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I do not understand why God would have such poor judgment to allow things like Christian television to be useful to some people, but I think it is, you know? <laughs> now, I... I don't like it and I don't agree with it, but, um, but it is incredibly arrogant to say there's no value in it when there are people who feel less lonely because they can watch a preacher on TV. So, um, and the, the really uncomfortable, if people don't know the conceit of the book, I watched 24 consecutive hours of Trinity Broadcasting Network and then um, people signed up in my life, my friends and my family and whatnot, they signed up to, for an hour each to watch it with me. So it's a 24-hour account of what's going on in my TV, what's going on in my living room, and what's going on in my head. So um, there were moments where I had, to, I had to say, oh my gosh, I think they got that one right. Like there were these beautiful moments where I was like, I cannot be cynical about what that person just said. And that was uncomfortable to me. That they might be. That they might be. There were moments where I had to go, okay, I'm going to give you that one. That was lovely, you know? Hmm. You know, back to the criticism just for a moment. You were the victim, and I use that word very specifically, of a fake news story. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, how did you navigate that? Yeah. That, 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 raised, that was toxic. So I um, did an interview with a gay man's magazine in Pittsburgh, and um, I was trying to think what, what would be a pastoral thing that I could say. And I, I know from pastoring a lot of queer folks that they have a lot of shame from the messaging that they receive from the church. And I said something about, they had asked me something about Oh, pornography, I think. And I said, well, it's not only one thing. And I think that I'm not interested in increasing the amount of shame that people have uh, for consuming pornography. I don't think that's a pastoral thing because people are already carrying a lot of shame. And when people have shame, it increases the um, compulsivity of their behavior. And uh, and I said something like, oh, it's not even one thing. There's like erotica and there's pornographic imagery that is made uh, in feminist circles. And there's like, there are all these different things that are all collectively called this one thing. So 
I don't know why the editor of the American Conservative was reading a gay men's magazine from Pittsburgh. I mean, <clears throat> but, um, <laughs> <clears throat> what he did was, um, and he's come after me before, what he did was he took one line from an hour-long interview and he crafted it, specifically crafted it, so it would stoke the moral outrage of his readership. And it said, feminist pastor, in quotes. Quotes, of course. Feminist pastor Nadia Boltzweber says pornography is ethical. And that was genetically modified to create moral outrage. And, um, and what happened was their readership started coming after me. And then these other outlets started writing stories based on their story and their readership. So, and then eventually my own readership, people who follow me would, would be saying, you know, Nadia, I usually really like what you say, but I'm sorry, pornography destroyed my marriage. I'm like, well, that's not probably technically true, but we'll go on. Um, and so I was, I was horrified that you would say this, right? So now nobody is actually referencing the source material, right, at all. So now works. everybody is reacting to a distortion of one sentence in the source material, but to them it's fact. And so um, I watched all of this. Now all of this is done very cynically because if you can get people to click on a headline, you get ad revenue. And so you want to be really specific about how you write the headlines. The headlines have to be genetically modified to, to get that hit of dopamine and for you to, for the readers to go, this is what's wrong with America, click, now you get ad revenue. This is the whole game. So I watched all of it happen, and then I had this sick feeling because I thought, how many times has somebody cynically crafted a headline to stoke my liberal moral outrage so that I would click it and they would get ad revenue, and I never questioned what the source material was. I never questioned, is it actually true? All I knew was it felt good to be outraged because this headline's making me angry. This is what's wrong with America. So um, this, is what, this is one of the things I so appreciate about you because on the one hand, you might, you know, be just really kind of worked up about this, but eventually you get to, hmm, I wonder how many times I've done this. Yeah. That's, I, I find that, yeah. Quite impressive. Actually. Yeah, self-incrimination is my, that's my go-to rhetorical move. <laughs> it's just because I have a lot of material to work with. But um, so ever since then, I do not, I honestly, I do not click on something if I don't recognize the source. I, I won't do it. I'm not going to give people ad revenue for this anymore. So. You know, one of the things in, uh, in your, I think it was in Pastrix, where you talk about when you told your parents that you were going to be a pastor, I was quite moved by your parents' response. Yeah. Uh, and your, your dad in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, did, what did he do? So, you know, I was raised in a tradition where women weren't allowed to be pastors or preachers. We couldn't really pray out loud in front of men. Um, you couldn't be an usher, nothing like this. And um, so that's the tradition I was raised in. And I thought I was going to do just some academic work in seminary. It, and um, when I realized I really wanted to be a pastor to my people, and um, I was worried about it, I was nervous about it, because there's not a lot about me that like screams Lutheran pastor. And um, I didn't I just had a lot of personal work I'd have to do to do that work. But, um, and I was scared to tell my parents. I didn't want them to shame me for it. And I didn't know what felt worse, them shaming me or the fact that in my 30s they still could. Um, but hey, I- Hey, they can, they're, they're capable, not a, just your parents, but they're capable throughout your yeah, life. Yeah, it's got a half-life on it. But um, so I, 
I told them, I said, look, I, I'm just, I really feel called to start a church and to be a pastor of my people, but I'm really nervous. I don't know that I have what it takes. And, um, and my dad went and got his Bible off the shelf, and I was like, oh, he's going to like. Here comes Leviticus. Yeah, he's going to be, <laughs> beat me with the scripture stick, you know. Um, but he wasn't, he wasn't turning to, you know, some of those letters that have some of that stuff in it. He was, it was farther in the front, and he opened it up to Esther when she felt called to do this thing, but she didn't think she was equipped to do it. And he just read the verse that said, but you were born for such a day as this. And he closes it, and my parents said a blessing over me. And, um, you know, receiving a blessing is something that is very powerful. And that blessing has really carried me through. And, um, you know, they, they still go to their Church of Christ in the mornings, and they often go to House for All Sinners and Saints at night. And um, it it was really what I needed in that moment, for sure. And it was very unexpected. Those are the best kinds, aren't they? Yeah. The ones that you aren't expecting. Yeah. I hate it when you expect a blessing and you don't get it. Like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst. <laughs> so so what, what's the difference? You have said that you preach from your scars, not your wounds. Or, yeah. And you write from your scars, yeah. not your wounds. What, what does that even mean? Well, it, I've changed how I think about that a little bit. And because, like right now, I have been writing out of my wounds, but I'm not writing about my wounds, if that makes sense. Um, what, what it, when I said it the first time, and I, I'm sure I'm not the first person to have said it even, but um, it, it had to do with uh, preaching and like uh, you're, the pulpit's not a therapist's couch, you know? If I'm going to admit something about myself, if I'm gonna be self-revealing in my work, um, pastorally, it's to create a space around me that is safe enough for people to step into to try to, con and they can consider what that kind of truth might be for them. I want, if I'm gonna be self-revealing, for somebody to have a response about themselves. If what they have instead is a reaction about me, I've not done it right. So um, to, if you're going to preach, you can do it from something that is not yet healed, but you can't do it about that thing that's not healed because people will have a reaction about you. They will be like, oh, I hope she's okay, you know? Um, so vulnerability is fine, but I don't want people to react to me. I want them to respond about themselves. Any other advice? About writing? Mm -hmm. No, not about anything else. No, just about writing. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not going to let you talk about anything else. <laughs> My gosh. Um, I think that voice is really critical to good writing and that nobody's voice is the same and to know what your voice is and that sometimes the only way to know what your voice is is to hear enough other voices is to read other writers you know and to um and to take seriously your particularity um that that's where the power is going to be. So not trying to be like someone else, not trying to sound like someone else, but to take your particularity really seriously. There's a risk to it, but um, but that's where the best writing comes from. I mean, can you imagine Toni Morrison trying to sound like Alice Walker? Do you know what I mean? You can't do it. There's such particularity in both these writers' voices. Um, I think there's a particularity to my voice, um, but sort of being free enough in myself to allow for that and to fight for it in the editorial process as well um, is, is really critical, I think. Uh, that's good advice. So many of your presentations, whether it's uh, the, uh, the confessional or uh, public speaking that you do, you end with a blessing. Mm. I think... In Accidental Saints, your 
take on the Beatitudes is so beautiful. I'm wondering if you would read that as a conclusion. Yeah, I'd love to. Receive this as a blessing. Maybe the Sermon on the Mount is all about Jesus' lavish blessing of the people around him on that hillside, blessing all the accidental saints in this world, especially those who that world, like ours, didn't seem to have much time for, like people in pain, people who work for peace instead of profit, people who exercise mercy instead of vengeance. Maybe Jesus was simply blessing the ones around him that day who didn't otherwise receive blessing, who had come to believe that for them blessings would never be in the cards. I mean, come on, doesn't that just sound like something Jesus would do, like extravagantly throwing around blessings as though they grew on trees? So I imagine Jesus standing among us, offering some new beatitudes like these. Blessed are the agnostics. Blessed are they who doubt, those who aren't sure, those who can still be surprised. Blessed are they who are spiritually impoverished and therefore not so certain about everything that they no longer take in new information. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are the preschoolers who cut in line at communion. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who have buried their loved ones, for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are they who have loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are the mothers of the miscarried. Blessed are they who don't have the luxury of taking things for granted anymore. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are those who no one else notices. The kids who sit alone at middle school lunch tables. The laundry guys at the hospital. The sex worker and the night shift street sweeper. Blessed are the forgotten. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the teens who have to figure out ways to hide the new cuts on their arms. Blessed are the meek. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are the wrongly accused, the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is hard, for Jesus chose to surround himself with people like them. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are those without lobbyists. Blessed are foster kids and special ed kids and every other kid who just wants to feel safe and loved. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the burned out social workers and the overworked teachers and the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the kind hearted football players and the fundraising trophy wives. Blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed are they who hear they are forgiven. Blessed is everyone who's ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally get it. I imagine Jesus standing here blessing us all because I believe that is our Lord's nature. Because after all, it was Jesus who had all the powers of the universe at his disposal and did not consider his equality with God something to be exploited. And instead, he came to us in the most vulnerable of ways, as a powerless flesh and blood newborn, as if to say, you may hate your bodies, but I am blessing all human flesh. You may admire strength and might, but I am blessing all human weakness. You may seek power, but I am blessing all human vulnerability. This Jesus whom we follow cried at the tomb of his friend and turned the other cheek and forgave those who hung him on a cross because he was God's beatitude, God's blessing to the weak, in a world that admires only the strong. Amen. Nadia Boltzweber, thank you for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.